And welcome to our new arts and innovation space, which actually just opened this fall. And um, we can actually poke around here too before we head up the hill to start our tour. Um, this has been an incredible space for our students. It's a place where kids can let their strengths shine and allow students to build and create and show what they know in ways that don't always involve reading and writing, although that's an important part of their experience here in the middle school too. Um, our goal for today is to help show you how GEC, give each child what they most need, happens in sixth grade. Um, GEC travels across the reservoir and comes over here too. Um, as Sue mentioned, we're gonna, we'll, we'll take you on a short tour. We can poke around this building so you can get a feel for what this space feels like. We'll take a little tour stopping at the gym. Hopefully there will be some kids in there and you can see some kids in action. And we're going to take you over to our Copacino building where our sixth grade is really held. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do on the middle school is create a space that's really special for the sixth grade. Um, and then as students move into seventh and eighth, they become more spread out on campus. So you'll have a chance to see a, a floor of Copacino that's really dedicated to sixth grade. It's where they spend a majority of their day. Um, it's where Sam's office is, and he is in the hallway as the passing of classes happen to help students. Um, and then we'll finish, as you said, with in the coal room, which is in our Sturrow building. And you'll hear from the real experts on campus, our sixth grade students. And you'll have a chance to ask them some questions about what it felt like to come from fifth to sixth grade. Um, we want to start by just sharing what is the same? Because there's so much, as Sue said, that is really, really similar. Um, it's the same population of kids. About 80% of our sixth graders come from the lower school. So, Sue, how many, how many fifth graders are here right now? Or in fifth grade? 66. 66. So that number will expand to about 80. So we'll have a cohort of new students that join us in the sixth grade. Um, teacher, the ratio, the class sizes are all going to feel the same. Um, our class sizes range from about four to five students up to eight or nine at the largest. And so the ratio feels very, very much the same. Teaching practices and training are all the same. Everybody here in the middle school is trained in Orton Gillingham, both in the approach for reading and the principles that guide our instruction. Our basic schedule is the same. Um, lower school rotates in the morning and then in the afternoon. A little change in the middle school is our schedule rotates all day. Um, and whereas the flex block in the lower school is part of our rotation, our flex block is anchored after lunch every day. So we have a rotating schedule much like the lower school, it just feels a little bit different. We are also a responsive classroom community in the middle school. So the day starts in a very similar way as it starts in fifth grade. We start in homerooms with a morning meeting time. The end of the day, students return back to their homerooms for a, a block of time we refer to as NCLU, No Child Left Unorganized. <laughs> and it's our opportunity for students to meet with advisors and other adults to help make sure that they feel really secure about going home to do their homework, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Conduct, dress code expectations, all the same. You, they won't feel, won't feel any different there. And homework is largely the same with a little bit of bump up. You know, Larry Brown often talks about coming into sixth grade as it's fifth grade plus one day. And that's really what we try to do. We raise the expectations just a little bit, just one extra day, and help them as they transition into the middle school experience. So Gek. Gek is our buddy. Gek is our friend, and Gek, as I said, travels across that reservoir. And as we are really trying to make sure that we're giving every child what they most need, um, we're going to share a little bit how that looks in sixth grade. And it starts with our induction in the first week, two weeks of school. So yeah, the induction actually starts in the spring. There's a couple of really cool opportunities for uh, the fifth graders to get to know some of the sixth grade team and this campus a little bit. Uh, we have two different events. The first is that uh, we have a day, I think it's in May, um, where all of the fifth graders are invited to the middle school campus for, I think it's about two hours. Um, 
And my goal for this day is, uh, the one, to build some familiarity uh, with these students, to get them to see the teachers that they're going to have next year, to get them to meet myself, Mr. Brody, uh, Ms. West. Also to give them a little bit of information about what ne next year is going to look like. It's definitely not the main goal. We explain a lot of the same stuff that we're going to say uh, here today, but all that information is then repeated to them at the start of the next year. Uh, but, you know, I'm really just trying to get the students excited to be here next year. So the way that that works is uh, all the students come over and we essentially break them into, I think it's five stations. Um, and at those five stations, there's two teachers um, from the sixth grade. So in just that two hour period, they're gonna get to meet 10 teachers from the sixth grade. Um, there's also gonna be eighth grade mentors. Um, I forget if we did seventh grade mentors. So I think we do seventh grade mentors so that they're here the next year. So they're eighth grade mentors when they're sixth graders. Um, and we'll have two of them, again, at each of those five stations. Um, and it'll be a similar experience to this where there'll be a station where they learn about homework and dress code. There'll be a um, station where they learn about field trips and fun events. There'll be a <coughs> one where they learn about uh, clubs and different extracurricular activities, sports teams that they can participate in. Um, so it's an opportunity to really break the ice in the spring and like I said, to get them excited about being on this amazing, beautiful campus. Um, and we also just have like a, uh, some recess time. I don't know if you guys have seen the sixth grade recess area, but it's amazing. It's a really big draw for kids. Um, That'll so, be a stop on the tour. Yes. You can yes. feel free to climb up the structure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's definitely it's an opportunity to uh, get kids excited, um, to get kids familiar with um, our campus, and to you know have that initial meeting. Um, we then also um, Sam and I um, head down to the Cape for a day um, and get to meet a bunch of the kids um, in a non-academic setting. Um, I love to you know participate in any of the fun active activities that they have there. So I think last year I did uh, biking. Um, I did uh, the beach one year. Um, there was like a, I forget what it was called, like a mud, muddy area. Do you know what it was? The muddy the salt area. marsh. Salt marsh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was very muddy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just like an opportunity to, again, get them excited about some of the people that they're going to be um, with next year and just to um, you know, build that connection. Uh, and then that first week that we get here, um, this is a really awesome first week for the students in the sixth grade. Uh, best part for them, no homework. No homework the first week half days, um, and a lot of short uh, class periods where they get to meet their teachers again, but not like dive head first uh, the first week and feel overwhelmed by what's happening. That first week is a whole lot of um, setting expectations, um, building relationships amongst everybody in the grade, but also, you know, each student's going to be in a homeroom with anywhere from six to eight students. And we do a lot of uh, building in that home room because that's going to be like your, yeah, that's your home base right here. That's going to be a really strong support for you. So we do a ton of team building activities and just getting those home room connections to be really strong. Uh, and again, it's going to be two teams of approximately 40 students. So um, like 40 of those students will all have like essentially the same teaching team. And that allows us to meet as a teaching team. And you know, uh, we're gonna have the same blocks that we have free. So we can have team meetings to talk about the students that we teach. Same thing for the other 40 students. It's gonna have a dedicated teaching team. They can meet and they can talk about those students. Um, so it's a really um, thoughtful introduction uh, to the year uh, with a lot of you know, realizing that this is a, you know, they're going from a different campus, they're at a new school, they went from being the biggest kid at their campus and now they're back to the bottom, they're the youngest kids. <laughs> so we're very uh, aware of that and we do a lot to try to get them excited, get them familiar and uh, just have the year start out very positively. Um, so yeah, it's a great induction of sixth grade. In terms of the academic piece and how we really bring GEC into the academics, um, we have a really robust focus area model as part of every child's academic program. So whereas most students are in a tutorial or maybe a small group fluency class as part of their academic program, we have an opportunity to dig a little deeper. And our focus area model includes OG tutorials in pairs, small groups. We also offer fluency comprehension and vocabulary instruction, a variety of different courses that target written expression, um, and we also have math focus areas. So for, at each grade, there are about three or four groups whose focus area is really math. Um, and I've spent the last 10 years as Glenn's Coleman in the middle school, um, and so 
We offer a lot of opportunities to meet with you folks to talk about the academic program of the student and why a particular focus area was chosen for your child. And we welcome that conversation at any point in the year. Um, the other nice piece about our focus area model is it's flexible. So we make changes over the course of the year as students' needs change. Um, and we can make slight little tweaks along the way. Our flex block, um, which students have experience with flex block in fifth grade and sixth grade, they will also have a flex block. And that's where students will participate in targeted cognitive intervention, which will also be familiar to them. They've done that this year. This is also where we do our health and wellness. Every grade um, has a targeted health and wellness section each year that spans about eight sessions. Um, and we also offer a skills booster. So it's about 30 sessions, either in the spring or the winter, where it's another opportunity for us to look at a student's trajectory of growth over time and target a particular area. So if reading fluency really needs another booster shot, that skills would be reading fluency. If computational math skills could use a little boost, that's what we'll do. So it's another opportunity for us to target some really specific instruction during that flex block. The other piece, as, as Greg was talking about homeroom and advisor group, our advising system is, is a really strong system. And your child's sixth grade advisor will be your primary point of contact. And they will also help your student um, navigate some of these sixth grade systems that are also helping students become strategic and active participants in their learning experience. One is our MAP system, and that MAP stands for Make a Plan. If a student is struggling with homework completion, or if we are really <coughs> set goals for increased class participation or active learning in the classroom, we will set a plan with a student. We will make a plan to have an opportunity for students to reach a particular goal, reflect with their advisor. And this is um, something that all, t all teachers will contribute to. But the advisor will really work with each of their advisees to make sure that this make a plan is moving in the right direction. <coughs> Do you want me to say tool time? That would be great. Yeah. Um, so tool time is one of my favorite parts of sixth grade. I think one of the most important parts as well. Um, essentially what tool time is, is it used to be six skills that we identified as the six most important skills that we believe um, kids are going to need as they transition to <coughs> middle school. We added one um, tool this year, so now we're up to seven. Uh, but those seven tools, Mr. Brody might need to help me here. Uh, we've got the binder tool. So first is um, just making sure that you're organized with all of your belongings. Uh, the second is the laptop tool. So making sure that you know how to use your laptop, you can create a document, you can use email, um, and you can do all those things on your computer, like use the map um, blog that we have on there. Um, and we are really, uh, really just lay it all out there. We give them a, a checklist of 10 things that you need to be able to do to earn that tool, which I'll talk about in, in a moment. Um, we have the homework planner tool. So that's a specific part of their laptop where they enter their homework in um, every day, they get their teacher to sign it, and then they put a check mark next to their homework once they've completed it. So it's a really good way for them to track their homework. Uh, we have the homework completion tool. So that's do you complete your homework fully? Are you answering questions in full sentences? Um, are you reading all parts of the directions? And again, there's a checklist of 10 specific things that we want you to be able to do to earn that tool. We also have the classroom participation tool. Um, so are you participating appropriately in class? Are you um, volunteering to read? Are you uh, answering questions during class? Are you um, participating with your classmates appropriately? And again, checklist, 10 things that you need to be able to do. Um, and then the uh, sixth one, the one that Mr. Brody just added this year, is called the level tool. Um, and that's essentially um, our zones of regulation. Um, so are you maintaining um, you know, your focus and your energy appropriately in class? Um, and essentially we have these different zones that students can be in um, with the idea of that we want to get students into the green zone, which is the best zone for learning. And do you have strategies to get out of, say, the red zone where you're a little bit too excited? What's the strategy that you have to get from that zone to the green zone? Um, so those are like the six foundational tools. And then the seventh tool um, is the self-advocacy tool, which we view as the most challenging tool for our students to earn. Um, and something that they continue to work on in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. 
Um, so the self-advocacy tool, which I'm sure you guys know a lot about, um, it's just you know being able to talk to your teachers about what you need specifically in the classroom. If you are having difficulty with your homework, um, do you just come in and say, I didn't get it? Or do you identify what specifically about your homework did you not get? If you have a night where you are unable to complete your homework, do you reach out to your teacher in advance? Um, so we are very deliberate in you know, what we expect from students and what we want them to walk away with after sixth grade. Um, and essentially the way that that works is that we spend the first term of the year, uh, first trimester of the year, um, teaching them about these tools. And then once the second trimester comes, um, we have the students actually apply for those tools. So what they do is they go online, they fill out a form, they send it to all their teachers, and they're like, I think I should earn the binder tool. Um, they got to give two reasons why. So one, I always put my homework in my homework section, and two, I can find whatever paper my teacher needs me to find. That is then sent out to that student's teaching team. If that student's teaching team agrees, they will all respond yes. If um, any of them disagree, they will respond not yet and give a very specific feedback, uh, like you, you sometimes leave your, um, your classwork on your desk and you don't bring it with you when you leave. Let's work for two weeks on not leaving anything in the classroom, um, and then that student will reapply, and then they'll earn that tool. And there are special privileges that students can earn um, if they um, earn their tools. So if you earn your homework planner tool, you no longer have to get your teacher to sign your homework planner in class because you've proven that you are able to use your homework planner effectively. If you get your homework planner tool and you get your homework completion tool, you actually NCLU yourself at the end of the day because you've proven not only can you uh, fill out your homework planner, but you're then also able to use it effectively when you go home. So there's these different incentives that students have uh, to try to earn these tools. And these are things that like, you know, you want to try to teach in the classroom, uh, but you know, so much of your time is spent on content that it's hard to find specific times to work on these skills. So we've carved out one to two times every week where students get to work on these tools with their um, advisor. So like I said, it's you know, one of my favorite parts of sixth grade and I think a really strong uh, part of our program. Yeah, I would say a primary goal of the sixth grade experience overall is to help teach students to be the most strategic self that they can be and to develop those self-advocacy skills. So we really view when a student makes a mistake or forgets a piece of homework or leaves a piece of paper on the table instead of plugging it away, we see that as an opportunity to have a conversation and a dialogue with the student to help them build the strategies for next time that happens. What, what would be a better strategy to put in place? Or how can you remember this next time? Um, and this is, this is an opportunity in sixth grade that I, I, the team is really proud of. Um, and it sets them up beautifully as they move through the middle school experience. And we actually have like a physical toolbox. That yeah, all the they kids, build it down yeah, here. All the kids create it uh, with a laser cutter. And then we have physical tools um, that have been printed with the laser cutter as well. And then at our whole grade meetings, um, every two weeks, I will announce the students who have earned their tool. They'll come up to the front. They'll actually get their physical tool. And so for them, it's like a really good opportunity to be recognized. Um, and also, like they see their buddies earning these tools. And even if they didn't buy in at first, typically they're like, all right, these are my tool. I better earn my tool as well. Yeah. And the whole little home rooms become a real community of support for each other. Um, so it's great. The other pieces of our academic program um, that really help us to get as best we can in sixth grade is we have a speech language pathologist who's dedicated to working with the sixth grade entirely and she provides push-in support for classes. She meets with teachers on a regular basis to help students and help teachers develop action plans for students. She meets with families um, as you may have questions that pop up. Um, and we also, as we already introduced, we have Sam, who lives on the second floor of Copacino um, and is there to help support the sixth grade as a whole also. And we're really fortunate for that. And we also have Allison, who's just everywhere. Any questions about any of these before we move on? Because we just gave a lot of information. What does that bottom bullet say? There's a counselor assigned to sixth grade. That's Sam. Once they earn a tool, can it get taken away? <laughs> if they don't stay motivated? Um, <laughs> yes, it can. Um, it happens rarely. There are, are check-ins. Um, like, we have tool time once a week. Um, so there have been cases in the past where that's happened, but I'd say that's more rare. Um, I'd say, like, the bar to earn your tool is relatively high. Mm -hmm. Um, so once a student um, earns that tool, they've pretty much shown that they have those skills, and uh, there can be check-ins for sure. 
At what point in sixth grade do they usually start earning them? Like um, October, November? So I think the first the first trimester, trimester ends, ends in uh, November. So, so right after, after that, that point, yeah. so there's okay. the, right there's, when you get back there's an entire trimester of practice, direct instruction, yep. practice, um, <laughs> time really carved out and scheduled for that. So like one of them is the for the homework completion tool. There's like a whole <laughs> lesson, and then there's a really fun document um, that the students have to fill out where it's essentially like 12 sets of directions. And the first direction is like um, read all directions before getting started. Second direction is like, write your name in all capital letters at the bottom, right up the page. The third one's like, hop around the room in one leg. And then you get down to the twelfth one, and it's only do directions one and two. So what you see is that a lot of students will right away start writing their name, start hopping around the room, and then you're like, alright, so listen, when you're doing your homework, one of the most important things that you need to make sure that you're doing is those things at the top, those one, two, three, those are really important directions. So we try to be very, um, you know, fun and um, informative in those in those times to try to help students learn those tools. So are there, are, do you find that there are, how do you find, in terms of the whole sixth grade, how quickly they earn these tools? Like do half the kids earn them very quickly and 25% take longer and 10% have more struggles? Or it's very you know? varied. Yeah. It's very varied. I would say the, the binder and the participation and the homework completion are typically earned sooner than, yep. than so others. So there's no order. So we suggest that students start off with the binder and the laptop and the homework planner. Those are the three that are the easiest to earn. Mm -hmm. Classroom participation and homework completion, those are definitely like you need to not go above and beyond, but mm -hmm. you got to do exactly what we're asking you to do. Uh, whereas binder, it's like we can, your teacher can support you a lot. Um, with that and um, I definitely like to have the students earn a tool or two at the start to get some momentum if you know a student is applying for their binder tool and you know that they, they lost one piece of paper or their binder is you know slightly off if it's their first tool we really want to get that momentum going at the start um, and again um, you know buy-in is important um, for these guys for sure and this is very much guided by the advisor I'd say by the end of the year we might have 25 students, 20 students who are, have earned all seven, and I don't think we've ever had a year where a, a student didn't earn any. Yeah. I just had a question on the speech language pathologist, yeah. and it sounds like there's more support there in the sixth grade, in front of the fifth grade, or will you know before coming to the sixth grade if your child needs more? Support? Yeah, so since all of our students have a language-based learning difference, we sort of assume every student can benefit from the support of a speech-language pathologist. Our speech-language pathologists in the middle school are also considered language teachers, and they teach some focus area classes. So in terms of the number of speech-language pathologists, we do have more in the middle school than we do in the lower school, but it's a, it's a slightly different focus. Um, so we do have Amberly Howe is our sixth grade speech language pathologist. She teaches two focus area classes and also pushes in to support various classrooms um, at various times and meets with teachers. So it's broader. It's broader. Yeah. And there are almost a hundred more students. Yes. Yep. Yep. I'm sure it varies through the year, but what's the like general expectation for the time spent on homework? Of the year, the end of the year, and then also, is there? Yeah, I just wanted to use your slide. <laughs> yes. And then also, uh, is there an expectation for nightly reading or certain yes. other days of the week? Yes. That's a really good question. So I'm going to jump down here for just a second, and then we'll come back to student how we address more student strengths. Um, so we do have some we like to call them developmental adjustments as they cross over into fifth grade plus day one plus one extra day. Homework does increase slightly. So the expectation in fifth grade is students are completing about 70 minutes of homework, and that includes, I think, 15 minutes of nightly reading. In sixth grade, we expect 20 minutes of nightly reading, um, and overall homework grows to about 85 minutes, plus or minus. Um, and again, as part of that tool time, we are directly instructing students, if they are struggling with their homework, what is their strategy? They could email a teacher. They could come in at before morning or at morning recess to connect with the teacher. 
So um, do a night at a glance for yeah. students who are, if, if a student is struggling uh, with homework completion, we have a, um, a document that that student can fill out every day during NCLU, which is called Night at a Glance, which essentially um, outlines their night. So there'll be a slot for 4 o'clock, 4.30, 5, 5.30, where that student can fill out like what they're doing during those different times and be like, all right, I have to do my science homework, which, which time can I, can I put that in? And so the student goes home with an actual plan for how they're going to complete their homework. Yeah, and that, that would be something that would happen during that NCLU, no child left unorganized, <laughs> at the end of the day. And that becomes especially helpful. We have an extremely robust after school program. Um, more than 85, what was the last percentage? Do we know? Like 85% of our middle school students participate in some form of after school activity, whether that be sports or performing arts or fab lab down here. Um, and we offer a wide variety of sports for students. Many, many kids are trying a sport for the first time, and that's wonderful, and there's a place for that. And then we have other students where there's students who are really skilled athletes. Um, so over 85% of our students do participate in some sort of after-school activity. Um, but just to continue on some of these adjustments, I had already mentioned this, we do grow to 80 students in the grade. Um, and as Greg shared, um, we know that they're in two teams of 40 for really dedicated teaching teams, but there's lots of, the kids see each other, all 80 kids see each other. Um, How many in all three grades? Approximately 80. So 80 in each, 6th, mm -hmm. 7th, mm -hmm. eighth. Yep. Yep. Um, access and use of technology expands. Every student is provided with a Chromebook that they take home every night. Um, we use Google Classroom and all the Google Suite documents, sheets, slides. Um, we teach students how to use all of those features. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of goal setting and reflection that happens as it relates to the technology, but also, as you heard, as it relates to their tool time, the goals that they're setting, um, and in individual classes. In terms of student strengths, you want to talk, mm -hmm. Greg, a little sure. bit about clubs and how yeah. spotted? Yes. Um, so another one of my favorite parts of middle school is our club system and this is something that lives during that flex block um, and so essentially like one of the big things that we try to do here is give students more independence not right away but you know gradually um, give them more independence give them more choice of what they do so on day we have a seven day rotating schedule on day two and on day five during flex they um, can participate in a club and Fridays every other and, Friday. yes and and Fridays um, so clubs are, so I run an active games club. Uh, Mr. Brody right now runs like a tech deck, which is like a little skateboard club. There's a gardening club, uh, an investment club. Um, knitting club. Knitting club. Craft um, club. Baking club. Baking, oh that's a good um, one. Yep. So there's all these different clubs and um, students always have the opportunity um, to suggest clubs. If they can get like a group of students who are like, oh man, I'd really love to do a board games club or any type of club that they feel like they would like to do. They need to get a teacher to help run that club. Uh, but then they, at each trimester, have a list of 10 to 15 different clubs, and they choose which one of those clubs they want to go to. So this is a huge rally point um, for our students that they know at least one time a week um, during that flex block, they're gonna have an opportunity to participate uh, in a club. Um, Hawk spotted. Uh, this is something that we just started this year um, with the idea, which I think, you know, no matter where you are, which school you're at, if you ask, you know, teachers, one of the things that they're going to look at is, like, how can we improve the behavior of our students? How can we promote positive behavior instead of just trying to um, knock down negative behavior? So we have a system called Hawks Spotted. We are the Carol Hawks. Um, and each one of these letters um, is an acronym for what are our core values. So honesty, accountability, work ethic, kindness, and safety. Um, and we have, I don't know if I have any down here with me, but we have these cards that we give out, um, which are Hawks Spotted cards. So if we see you around campus demonstrating any of these characteristics, it could be in class, it could be at recess, um, we'll give a student a Hawks Spotted card. That student will then take that card and um, deliver it to their advisor, be like, hey, I got this card, I did something really good um, in one of my classes or at recess. Um, that teacher will enter it into their map log. So, so the only thing in their map log is not just you missed homework. It also has some of these really positive things as well. Um, and then at each grade level, we every two weeks we select one of those Hawk Spotted cards to recognize in front of the whole school. Um, so again, this is a way for us to really uh, promote positive behavior among students. 
And um, you know, I've just seen this program be really, really effective um, and have a really positive influence on our students. Um, just one example that I want to share was a couple weeks ago, we were at the gym, we have recess in the gym um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the morning, and they had badminton set up, and we have uh, like 40 badminton rackets. We've got 80 students. Um, so like five minutes into it, there were some people coming up to me being like, I, I want to play badminton, but I don't have a racket. Um, so I just yelled to everybody. I said, does anybody want to give up their racket so somebody else can play? And I had students running over to me, giving me their racket ah. so that other people could play. I wrote every single one of those students who gave me a, um, their badminton racket a Hawks card. And I honestly do not think that that would have gone the same way had we not been doing Hawks spot at all year. So students are looking for opportunities to demonstrate um, these core values. Um, so again, it's a way for a teacher to give a student feedback that's not you know, negative about their behavior, but, but for positive. And we have a, a mascot costume. Yes. And his name is Eric the Hawk. So we try and tie it. I bet, could you guys sing the Eric song? <laughs> they they oh, come to sixth grade yeah, singing oh, yeah. oh. Eric. <laughs> um, the other piece of, in the middle school is student government. And Allison and Harmon and I um, advise the student council. And you can only apply for the high, you can only run for office when you're in eighth grade, but we open open it up for sixth, seventh, and eighth graders to participate. And our sixth graders are always make up the largest group. <laughs> they are so enthusiastic, they have such great ideas, um, and it's an opportunity for our sixth graders to have a voice in the community. We had a large group of sixth graders this year help um, put together a snowball event that we had on a Thursday evening here that was highly successful. We had at least 100 kids, I think, show up. Um, and that, that's a really nice opportunity, and other service groups happen. We also have a few alliance groups in the middle school that students have an opportunity to participate in during lunch. Um, and that is, again, another opportunity for students to have voice and make choice about what they want to participate in. It's a really great opportunity. And this is our last, we wanted to share, what are some of the sixth grade traditions and rally points? And we have a ton. It's not all academics all the time. We do try to build in some, some fun. So I think these are in um, chronological order, um, how they happen throughout the year. Um, so there are a lot of really fun opportunities for students to do things other than traditional learning. Um, so one, obviously, is Fall Festival. Our lower school students participate in Fall Festival mm -hmm. already. Um, but it's a really, really, important day here um, at the middle school. That happens I think, in October. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like our first really big um, rally point day for our students. Um, the next thing that we have is a sixth grade only tradition, um, and that is the sixth grade Halloween party. Um, and there's a big homeroom component to this, um, where it's like a really an opportunity for our homerooms to try to bond and do something um, together. So um, we have homerooms dress up in costumes that are uh, together, so they'll pick a theme, um, and they're all dressed up together. Uh, so they stay after school, it's on a Thursday again, um, and it runs from, you know, right at the time school ends, 3.15, until about 7.30. Uh, we have a visit from Curious Creatures, uh, which is a live animal performance group, um, so it can be um, really exciting for the for students um, to get to see um, flying squirrel, uh, tarantula, snake, skunk. skunk. Um, we have like an alligator, a little baby alligator. Um, so it's like a really, really memorable um, day for students. They get to go to a homeroom pizza party, and then we have um, music and all these different Halloween stations um, set up in the gym and turn the gym essentially into a uh, middle school appropriate haunted house. Um, so it's really a lot of fun. Uh, we also uh, visit some different local, um, whether it's farms, there's a water treatment plant around here that we um, go and visit, um, and just having like some different outings with students. One of my favorite days of the year is one that we just had, uh, which is Multiple Intelligences Day and Dyslexic, Dyslexic Advantage Day, where we give students an opportunity to um, test out their skills in a whole bunch of different areas. They spend a whole um, it's like a Friday, so it's a half day, but they spend that whole half day um, in five different stations working on their musical skills, um, their nature skills, their gym skills, uh, their linguistic skills, their uh, logic skills, um, and you know, just explore their own um, dyslexic advantages. 
Um, we also have students who tomorrow, I think there's 15 sixth graders who are going away on a Bounders trip where they'll spend Thursday and Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, are they going to New Hampshire? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're going to New Hampshire. Um, with uh, our Bounders teachers and a sixth grade teacher is going um, on the trip as well. Um, How do you determine which 15 students? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know if it was only 15 who applied. I don't. If, if I don't they, yeah. they don't. You typically cut it off. Yeah. If, if kids express an interest, that's why they had they had another teacher go yeah. with them. This is a bigger group yeah. this year. And eighth grade, fifth grade. I mean, lower school bombers teacher also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we every year go to the Museum of Fine Arts when they have their Egypt exhibit. Um, Egypt is one of the ancient civilizations that we study in sixth grade, so we get to go to the MFA um, for a day, and we spend about an hour and a half on a guided tour um, of the Egypt exhibit. But we also get to explore the other parts of the museum. And it's also like a really cool park right next to the museum as well, where we have lunch, we have a picnic, and um, again, a really memorable day for students. And then the end of the year, lots of really fun stuff. Sixth grade has uh, the sixth grade Olympics, which happened out here again. Um, you work with your homeroom and you compete in all these different events and um, really, really fun. And then our kind of uh, culminating event is we take a trip to Canada Lake Park. Mm -hmm. I already talked about these weekly crowd points. Yep, and you know, the whole school also participates in a large Gaga tournament at oh, the end of the yeah. year, which is a really big, um, big day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have an ice cream truck come. So we try to end the year in a really fun, community building way. Just like we start with fall festival, we try and end with a big hurrah. Can you just mention, do they have to do sports each trimester? Is that required? No, good question. So it's not required. Um, it's just that many of our students do end up participating in some form of after school. And we offer a wide variety of options. It's not just sports based. Sports -based. Um, there is Fab Lab is, a, is one of our afternoon clubs or activities. Um, right now singing. the play. Pardon? There's a singing one. There is. There's a chorus. Um, the, our spring musical, our spring play is, is in the process of getting up and running, so that's an afternoon activity as well. Um, so it's not... It's entirely optional. It's entirely optional. The other thing that a lot of students will do is we have an after-school study hall, mm -hmm. structured study hall, Monday through Thursday, so a lot of students will, will participate in that. And there, again, there's there's flexibility. So if a student is participating, we have track about to get started, spring track. If a student is feeling particularly stressed one, one week because they feel like they have a lot of work to complete, they can start off in study hall and then join track practice if need be. Um, so we do, there is some flexibility in how students participate. And what are the two end times that you do or don't participate in the afternoon activity? Oh, that's a good question. We end at 310. Same hours as the lower school, and if you participate in an afternoon activity, it's approximately 4:45. Although sometimes games or track meets will go a little later, but you would be notified of that. Yeah. Um, two things: Can you speak a little bit to like the STEM activities and curriculum that you do, and also um, you were the curriculum director, mm -hmm. so who is in that role now? Yeah. So. Well, that's a good question, and we are in, we're in the process. We're in our hiring season right now, so I don't have an answer for that. <coughs> um, in terms of the STEM activities, we are still kind of learning and experience and experimenting with how to best use this space. This year, we have a group of sixth graders who are spending a tremendous amount of time down here during their science and history classes, and that has been a wonderful experience. We, this space is also, we can accommodate up to about 40 students at a time here, roughly. Mm -hmm. And our art room is down the hall here, so students, when it's their turn to come to art, are also in this space. Um, but teachers have access to this. So any teacher in the school who is engaged in a project can work down here. This is a flexible workspace. It's a meeting space today, but typically we have lots of tables and chairs in here for students to work. And we can take a quick loop around and you can see some of the other workspaces. So it's, it's, it's really flexible. It's not a dedicated class that students take necessarily, but it's built into a unit or a lesson that teachers are um, in the process of creating or delivering. This space is also jammed at lunch. They open this up at lunchtime, so students who want to eat lunch and create and build, they are, they're down here and we open up this back 
backyard here for some running around if they want to get out and run around. Um, and then there's the afternoon piece. And so is there like a science like where they do labs and things? Is that here? Is that yeah, when we go on our tour up in up in the Cobasino building, you'll be able to have two science labs that are dedicated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What is the science curriculum? I mean, what, is there like a focus on like earth sciences for sixth grade or exactly? Yep. So sixth grade is earth science. Mm -hmm. What is seventh and eighth? So it's earth science, and then they get into a lot of physics, okay. um, and then biology. Mm -hmm. And there, there, and then there. For the focus areas, you mentioned OG, and then things like comprehension or fluency. What are the programs that you're using for those? Are they similar to the lower school? They're similar. Um, for fluency, because there's a wide range of, when you peel back the layers of the onion to identify <laughs> what is causing the child to struggle with fluency, we have many different approaches for addressing fluency. We do have some computer-based interventions, but it's a, it's a lot of um, Orton-Gillingham-based instruction with additional oral reading support that's happening. Um, for comprehension, we're using active reading strategies for narrative text, and for informational text, we pull from a lot of the strategies that they've learned with report form, which is Project Read, many of, many of the, uh, which students in fifth grade have covered. Speaking of running around, are you going to have Spark up here or something like it? We do. So we don't have, we don't call it Spark in the morning, but there is, students can come as early as 7.30 and run around the gym. So I, it's sort of sparky. <laughs> <laughs> middle school sparky. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a good question. Thank you. I saw a hand over here. Yes. Yep. Can you talk about the role of the advisor? How is that? Assign sure. and how many you know how often do the kids meet with their advisor? How does that work? Sure. So we try to have the advisor also teach the student a class during the course of the day. There are some instances where that doesn't happen. A tremendous amount of time is spent over the summer, and our counseling team works really, really closely together to create homeroom groups in collaboration with team leaders and fifth grade team and myself and others. And we pull together groups of kids in really intentional ways. And we match them with advisors in really, in really intentional ways. Um, and as Greg mentioned, they really don't exceed eight, maybe nine students in a, in a homeroom group. Every morning starts as a homeroom group. There's a morning meeting. We, have, we follow responsive classroom practices in that way. Um, and then they end their day in that homeroom. And then, there's also an opportunity if that advisor teaches that student to see them at another point in the day. But that homeroom person really becomes the grounding, the anchor for, for their advisees. So they might stop in there at lunch. They might swing by there on snack to grab something out of their, out of their space. So that becomes their home base. So their homeroom teacher is their advisor. Their homeroom, oh yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Homeroom teacher and advisor are synonymous, yeah. Very similar to fifth grade. Yeah. 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 Um, in the after school, like sports in particular, are they? Is it a sixth grade <coughs> team or is it middle school team? Uh, it depends on the number of students who are participating in that sport. Um, like we had an ultimate frisbee team in the fall that was six, seventh, eighth graders. Uh, but like for basketball, uh, we had a sixth grade team, a seventh grade team, an eighth grade team. Um, I think for lacrosse, we had like a sixth, seventh grade team and a yeah. seventh, eighth grade team. So um, it depends on the number of students, but for like some of the bigger, for most of the bigger sports, it's yeah. Hockey grade. was multi-grade. Mm -hmm. um, track is multi-grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does it work with the upper school being eight to nine? Do they participate in the same they sports? They do. Mm -hmm. yeah. They do. Yeah. They bus here yep. or we go to Wayland for, yep. for soccer. On the fields. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Should we, should we get them moving? Yeah. yeah. Can you ask questions? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So let's do that. Why don't we split? We're gonna split in two 